resolved. Hello. OK. Now it works. Thanks. <laughs> well, so thank you very much to, to organizers for the kind invitation to participate in this workshop. Um, the work I will present today was done in collaboration with uh, Alejandro, Jorge Castaño, and Marcelo Leve. The three of them are actually present here in the audience. This is a picture of uh, Santiago de Chile in our last winter, where Universidad Católica, the institution I'm based on, is uh, located. And uh, <clears throat> the work I will discuss today is a relatively basic, however, fundamental question, which concerns about the origin of the so-called magnetic mass in, uh, in fermion, uh, fermion particles, in QED in particular. And why is it important to, to discuss the presence of intense magnetic fields in the propagation of particles? Well, I mean, it, both af it, will, it can both affect either charged particles, but also uh, non-charged particles, such as photons, due to the fact that in quantum field theory, we believe that vacuum has properties. It fluctuates. So there can be um, electron-positron, for example, fluctuations, uh, quantum fluctuations that affect um, the propagation of photons, through a, for example, through a magnetized uh, medium. Um, a lot of these uh, applications that I'm listing today have been already discussed along this workshop. So mainly I would like to focus on these uh, early results that uh, were previous uh, analysis of this problem have led to estimations of the magnetic uh, renormalization of the fermion mass um, <clears throat> of being at the leading order quadratic in, in the logarithm of this dimensionless scale. I have to say that these estimations, we can call it a double logarithm, logarithm were mainly obtained by confining or, or restricting the calculation to the so-called preferred state or lowest Landau level state in the system. And uh, <clears throat> if one wants to inspect uh, the origin of these uh, corrections, of course, at the level of one loop, one needs to inspect on this self-energy diagram. In order to think a little bit out of the box, let me first, for the sake of the analogy, compare these two important pieces of, of art. So we have on the left-hand side the School of Athens, where, as we can clearly see, space is just pictured as in the classical uh, paradigm, as, a, in, as an inert three-dimensional frame where matter, that mean, means objects, are distributed with very precise mathematical coordinates, perspective is also involved, and light is only shining on top of them. This is what we can call a classical picture. But on the other, on the other side, there is this famous painting by Van Gogh, The Starry Night, where now space actually has properties. Space is an active element. So we cannot anymore distinguish matter from light, nor from space, because light and matter are strongly entangled, right? So it's fluctuations of light in, in rather painful fluctuations in the painting that give rise to matter without you know, precise con uh, contours. This I would call a quantum field theory picture. And then as quantum field the theorists, we all believe in path integrals as a faithful representation of single particle quantum mechanics. And as a simple exercise, when you calculate a, um, a path integral, then you can immediately identify that the leading contribution is given precisely by the classical action. So even though quantum mechanics it migrates from this classical picture towards some intermediate point in between the quantum field theory picture, but it's still the classical action, the classical trajectories are part of this scenario, are contained as significant information of this, of this propagator. So let me just quickly recall what happens when a classical, uh, classical uh, charged particle is immersed in, a, in an electromagnetic field. So if we start from, <coughs> from the covariant formulation of the problem, where Q is the charge, M is the mass, this gamma, of course, is the Lorentz dilation factor, then if you resolve this equation in components, then you get two, two equations which are coupled, in particular, the second equation tells us that if there is an electric field present, there will be dissipation, energy dissipation. And this means that this Lorentz factor will change with time. But if there is no electric field and it's only a, a constant magnetic field present, then this gamma factor will be constant and the modulus of the velocity of this particle will remain constant. 
Well, from the first equation, it, uh, if we, if we uh, don't take into account the, the electric field contribution because it's, it vanishes, it's natural to decouple the motion into two uh, mutually orthogonal directions, the one which is par uh, parallel to a magnetic field and the one that is orthogonal to it. The parallel one from the equation of motion uh, remains constant, while the perpendicular plane, in the perpendicular plane, we have this, this uh, circulation of the velocity around the axis defined by this vector, so-called the cyclotron frequency, which is parallel to a magnetic field. If you care about solving for a trajectory, of course, it's a simple exercise. You get that the trajectories have a constant radius. And this radius is a cyclotron radius, which is the ratio between the square of the perpendicular velocity and the cyclotronic frequency. So this is how the motion looks like. We have these helical paths, which propagate along the axis defined by the, the magnetic field, and these helical paths have a constant uh, radius. But then there is a second constant of motion, which is the angular momentum, since the effective uh, force is radially pointing towards the center of the helix. And if this, uh, is the, if this uh, angular momentum in the, again, you know, in the frame of uh, classical mechanics is considered as an action variable, it remains constant. And if I was to solve quantum mechanics without actually solving it, just by the semi-classical connection, I would use for Sommerfeld quantization such that this angular momentum is not only conserved, but actually is quantized. And there is an, an integer number, this n value, which can be 0, 1, 2, etc., that will quantize angular momentum. And if I solved for the radius of the helical path, what I will get is that this is proportional to the square root of this uh, integer that is also quantized and proportional to this magnitude, which has the dimensions of length, which is called the magnetic lambda radius. So basically, the message, the technical message here is that we have now in the, in the quantum mechanical picture, in an heuristic, you know, semi-classical way, we can interpret the propagation of these quantum particles as still having some information of the classical helical paths, but now the radius of them is quantized and is proportional to this, to this uh, um, characteristic radius, which is inversely uh, proportional to the square root of the field. If I wanted to go further and get the energy spectrum just from the relativistic relation, then I would have to solve the perpendicular, perpendicular uh, component of the, of the linear momentum. And just by substituting, I would, I would get this expression in terms of the lambda radius. And therefore, I get basically the lambda level spectrum without actually solving quantum mechanics. But of course, this is nearly the lambda spectrum because spin is not in, uh, involved in the picture. If you wanted to actually solve the problem in a kosher way, you have to solve the Dirac's equation with the magnetic field. You have to choose a gauge for that. Then once you choose a gauge, you immediately see that this, this Hamiltonian is commutes with translations along the, the Z component, given that the magnetic field is along the Z axis. So you can, uh, when finding or looking for eigenvectors and eigenstates, you have to uh, factorize this plane wave dependence on the axial coordinate along the field, and then you get a clear decomposition, as in the classical picture, between the perpendicular and parallel directions for the propagation of such particles. In the spectrum you, you get, as you can see, is basically the same I could simply guess right by using a bohr sommer quantization. So now let's go to a quantum field theory a analysis of the problem. Then we have to look for the structure of the propagator. Then, uh, because of the natural decomposition of the coordinates, we'll decompose as well the metric in a parallel a component in a perpendicular subspace. And for that metric, every four vector then will be also decomposed into these two uh, mutually orthogonal subspaces with the corresponding definition of the, of the uh, square of the four vector. So for this problem, what we have is the so-called, uh, as, as Schwinger already you know, uh, discussed uh, many years ago, we have the Schwinger propagator that has both um, translation and invariant component, which can be Fourier transform like this, but also retains a phase 
a magnetic phase. And it turns out that the translational invariant component can be expressed in terms of this uh, Schwinger proper time parameter. Alternatively, it can also be decomposed into a, a set of uh, Landau level uh, eigenstates. So we can immediately recognize here the presence of the Landau level spectrum, as I was discussing. And now in the quantum field theory picture, the role of this Landau radius is to modulate the spread right, of, the, of the propagator across the plane perpendicular to the axis of the magnetic field. So in a sense, the quantum, quantum field theory propagator is reminiscent of the idea of these helical paths where the radius is not, is not anymore a fixed radius as in a classical picture, but it has a near, you know, Gaussian distributed shape. And about the phase. So the Schindler phase actually contains information about translational symmetry breaking in the system. So if we have to compute the mass at the level of one loop, then as I, as I said at the beginning, we have to compute this self-energy diagram. Where here the propagator is the, the, the propagator dressed by the external constant magnetic field. So the expression for the diagram, here it is, is, a, is an integral that involves both the Fermi propagator as well as the virtual photon that connects the two, the two, these two points. So what about the Schwinger magnetic phase? In principle, if I was in configurational space, these two would be configurational space points, let's say X and X prime. So this would be present in the information in the Schwinger phase. However, the Schwinger phase, here it is the, the full expression, can be with a, an appropriate gauge transformation can be removed from the picture. Uh, in particular, if you take this path parameterization, you can first prove that this contribution to the phase, the Schwinger phase, will actually vanish. When you substitute this path parameterization, you get this, this uh, symmetric contraction of the anti-symmetric uh, electromagnetic tensor, and this just by symmetry vanishes. As for the other piece, which involves the vector potential, then for the gauge we, we picked, uh, <clears throat> if you evaluate the, the integral, you get something which is proportional to the, to the distance between the two, the two configurational space points, x and x prime. But by choosing a gauge transformation with this particular choice, you can prove that now the integral can be reduced to exactly zero. And therefore, the Schwinger phase can be, in practice, removed. OK, so let me just go now to the more technical aspects of the calculation. So here we have the photon propagator that can be cast also in a Schwinger parameter, uh, Schwinger parameter integral. Uh, here we have the fermion propagator, already contracted with the Dirac gamma matrices, which are part of the diagram. And if we insert these two propagators in the expression for the self-energy, we calculate the, in, the internal momentum uh, integral. The only thing that remains is a double integral now in the Schwinger parameters of the photon propagator and the Fermi propagator. So the Schwinger, the Schwinger double parameter integral um, has, as you can see, an exponential term which is not part of the Schwinger phase, but it comes from the propagators themselves, and also has a structure here which goes with the matrices gamma one, gamma two. So it is convenient to recast the expression in terms of these dimensionless uh, variables. So now we, we shall call tau and, and uh, x as a function of s and y, these are going to be our new integral, uh, our new parametric uh, integral variables. This is a, a dimensionless magnetic field, and we also non-dimensionalize the, the two momenta. So uh, schematically, then the self-energy double integral this is still a double integral, but now in these two parameters can be expressed in terms of these uh, these three terms a, b, and c where A, B, and C are defined as in the, in the picture. And then in particular, as I mentioned before, this term C contains this combination I, gamma 1, gamma 2. So this I, gamma 1, gamma 2 is nothing but 
the spin operator, right? This is what this combination is. So basically this term is involving the coupling between the magnetic field and the spin of the fermion. As for this phase, this is a scalar phase that shows up in the exponential term. It is given by this rather complicated ratio between trigonometric uh, functions, cosines and sines. So what we're gonna do here now in order to define this, this uh, mass shift due to a magnetic field is to impose renormalization conditions. So these renormalization conditions are chosen such as the mass, the physical mass, reduces to the mass of the particle when the magnetic field is not present. Okay, so that's why we, we define a C, to be zero at, uh, at uh, P slash equals M, M being the physical mass at zero field. Same condition here. In this particular limit, the scalar phase that shows up in this parametric representation of a self energy, it reduces to a simple form. And if we, we evaluate the renormalized uh, uh, expression as defined here at zero field, we need to add, in order to satisfy one and two, we need to add appropriate cantor terms. So the choices of the cantor terms is as to satisfy one and two, and here they are. They, have, they are relatively simple expressions, one and two. So now, including both the initial expression plus the cantor terms that allows us to impose the normalization conditions, this is the full expression for the self-energy uh, contribution at finite magnetic field now. And here's what I was mentioned before. So this term C, which is the key point in the argument, is proportional precisely to this spin magnetic field coupling, right? This is what we have here. So then it is convenient to separate the, cell, the self energy by using these uh, spin projectors. These are orthogonal spin projectors that separate the, now the spin or state in, um, in those which are par parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field. And now we define this, uh, this uh, mass shift due to a magnetic field uh, as the, the, the mass of the particle at a finite magnetic field minus the, the mass of the particle at zero field. So it's a strictly magnetic field dependent contribution. By construction, because of the renormalization conditions we chose, in the limit of zero field, this, this um, mass shift will vanish, of course. And since the self energy has this natural decomposition into parallel and anti-parallel to the spin components along the magnetic field direction, then we can do exactly the same here when defining the mass, mass shift. So these are analytical expressions for the mass shift. These different signs uh, distinguish the two spin components in principle. And the strategy to evaluate this uh, rather complicated integral is to consider the whole uh, integration domain, which is for s in between 0 and 1, uh, for, and for y in between uh, 0 up to infinity. And then uh, in, this, in this domain, we distinguish three regions. The first one is for S less than the inverse magnetic field scale. Remember that B, uh, this italic B, is actually the inverse of a magnetic field in dimensions units. And there is a second region where S is larger than that, and also Y is larger than that. And this, uh, this, uh, this third region where we have the, the other condition. For physical uh, reasons, we're interested in the large magnetic field uh, limit, not the infinitely large one, of course, because then, then we, we're not adding any, any further uh, input to the physical analysis. We want something which is large, but not necessarily super large. And then we split the integral in these three integration domains, and therefore we have three separate contributions for the mass shift uh, as arising from each region. Region one and region two can be, the integrals can be calculated with the standard expansion techniques in order to get a series in inverse 
uh, inverse powers of the strength of the magnetic field. One remarkable point, though, is that both this term as well as this term contain a small, because it's inverse to a field strength, however finite in principle, imaginary contribution. I will go back to that point later. Uh, while the third region, which is the, the dominant one, the one that gives the largest contribution to the, to the integral, is defined here. And then we have this, uh, this tangent function, which is part of the, the integration uh, the, uh, of, the, of the function that, that is being integrated. And then <clears throat> the, the point is that the tangent function is a periodic function. So there is no, no way to expand it in a, there's no way to expand it in a, in a standard a Taylor, Taylor power series to cover the whole domain. It's actually a Lorentz series if one wants to, to be very strict about the, the mathematics. So in order not to lose these periodicity features, we have to resource to an appropriate periodic representation of the tangent function, which is this one. And now you can recognize that this periodic representation, again, we have basically the contribution from the Landau levels. These are two n times the magnetic field. This is the, the periodic representation. So we can calculate the, by using this expansion, we can calculate these terms of the, the series one by one in terms of gamma, incomplete gamma functions for the lowest Landau level, for the higher, or, higher order Landau levels. The, the, the incomplete gamma function has a logarithmic dependence of the argument plus a finite, uh, plus an infinite series, power series. And then here is the, here's the analytical result. And now if we go to, to large uh, values of, uh, of the magnetic field, we recover, as expected, the double logarithm dependency that, that uh, arises basically from the lowest Landau level, then equals zero term in the series, plus a subleading correction, which is proportional to the logarithm of the field. And this subleading correction contains an imaginary component. So putting all together, we have this contribution arising from the dominant um, region in the integral. So we recovered the previous, uh, previous results by Machet, for example, but we also have this intriguing uh, imaginary contribution. If we plot now the, the real and imaginary parts of this, of this uh, mass shift, we see that for large fields, actually the, the the spin splitting becomes less and less important. They tend to converge to a single value. And uh, moreover, for the, as for the renormalization of the dressed, magnetically dressed propagator, we see that if we use the same, um, the same uh, orthogonal projector eigenbasis, we can write it down in terms of, uh, of a superposition of two uh, propagators, each for one spin uh, component. So now, in order to define the physical mass, the physical magnetic mass, we attribute it to a real part of this self-energy, while we have still a finite imaginary part. And this imaginary part, we have to interpret. So what is the interpretation of the imaginary part? Well, if you, if you take the, the, the fermion propagator, here you include the real part of, as, as part of the definition of the physical mass, then the imaginary part plays the role of a spectral broadening, essentially. Uh, just like you have in a typical bright Wigner resonance. However, this spectral broadening, when compared to the, to the leading value of the real uh, mass, decreases as the inverse of the logarithm of the magnetic field. And therefore, decays to zero when the magnetic field becomes ext extremely strong. At the level of, the, of a spectral density, what we have because of this, uh, of this uh, spectral broadening is a Lorentzian instead of a, instead of a delta function as in a typical particle state. And the width of this Lorentzian will, uh, as we keep increasing the field, when the field becomes infinitely large, eventually becomes, uh, becomes super narrow and converges to a delta function. And then the mass is defined by the mass of the lowest Landau level. So, <clears throat> so in conclusion, um, what we observe is a renormalization of the mass that for the real part agrees with what uh, has been seen in the literature so far. 
However, we obtain this imaginary contribution that points to the idea, towards the idea that there is a spectral broadening of the, of the spectral density due to the presence of this discrete set of the Landau levels that emerge as, a, as an effect of the interaction between the field and the fermion. Um, okay, so thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to answer. Yes. In the diagram you draw, you were there, is, there was an electron coming, and then the loop. Oh, okay. Well, actually, now, the, the, the electron. actually, it's only a self-energy diagram, right? We are not adding any external legs to it. Okay, but anyway, so at the vertex, mm -hmm. the momentum of the external electron it's defined, yes. is that's, well defined. That's the assumption, right? So you have a uh, defined momentum that uh, gets yeah. in, then you get the, the, the fluctuation be. with the virtual photon, and then, and then the this momentum goes you are assuming the electron is a plane wave. Yes, but the, then the question is, when you have, when you have a definite momentum, there are two, those are two different eigenbases, if you want. I'm sorry? Momentum eigenstate, Fourier eigenbases, and Landau bases are two orthogonal eigenbases, right? Yeah. So if you think that you have a plane wave, plane waves are as good as an eigenbasis as it is any other orthogonal eigenbase. So you yes. can, in principle, decompose Landau levels in Fourier, in Fourier modes sure, or vice versa. But you are fixing your momentum. You are saying that yes, moment, so the, four moment, the three momentum is zero, mm -hmm. and the, the fourth component is the mass, so it's fixed. The, the four momentum is fixed, exactly. This cannot be. I mean, you cannot fit. I mean, you are assuming it's at rest. No, I'm not assuming it, I'm yeah, not assuming it, it is a rest. I'm just saying this is a self-energy diagram no, but for a particle that comes with a given okay, momentum can, or for momentum, it, but we can discuss it. I'm actually also a bit confused and a bit excited. Um, so uh, the confusing part is coming from uh, what Norberto mentioned. You don't have just one Landau levels. You have essentially infinitely many of yes, them. Exactly. And each and every one of them will have a width. Yes. What you are suggesting, it seems like they're all gonna be the same. What Norberta is saying, that if you consider the Landau level separately, you will see that they have different width. So, and I think that's the resolution to that problem. And the part that I'm very excited about it is that the width of the uh, Landau levels, if let's say they all go roughly the same way as you calculated, is decreasing with the increasing magnetic field. That's right. And actually, it's of great importance in application to this uh, topic that I was presenting uh, yesterday about magnetars, because I was kind of suspecting that that's happening, but I didn't have any calculations. So that's very nice to see. OK, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the, for the nice talk. So maybe one different way to put what Norberto is saying that is that if you don't amputate your diagram, you mm -hmm. put the, the, sp the spinor solutions to the two edges, then those have to be the spinor solutions in the presence of the magnetic field. So they are not plane waves, but they are going to be Landau level eigenstates. And then uh, this is what you have to I, work I, with. I understand the point, but, uh, but uh, I would like to say that it depends on the physical scenario you're trying to represent. If I think about a particle which comes as a free particle state and enters a region where the magnetic field is present, Right? Then the question is how this defined plane wave state, it is just a Dirac particle state with a given uh, momentum, will eventually right, a, a split into a collection of discrete levels, which are the Landau levels. Of course, you cannot match exactly a given momentum, which is the point, I think, of Norberto. You cannot match exactly a given form momentum to a, to a discrete spectrum, right? So that's why you have a, a spectral broadening. But then if, if I can make an analogy, here you have an optical analogy, a prism, right? A, what, what does a prism, right? A prism with, for photons is a media where you, you enter as a plane wave. The plane wave contains, in principle, all the different wavelengths, but then what the prism does is to separate them. So if you imagine that the prism is like your, your static magnetic field, and you, and you come up with a plane wave state, what, you, what is gonna happen is that this plane wave state is just gonna spread all over the, the Landau level spectrum. 
which is consistent with energy conservation, of course. And then the spectral broadening, broadening will be given by the spectral broadening of this you know, rainbow uh, light that is coming out. That will be my, my analogy, if you like. Thank you for, for, for the nice talk. If I may add to the discussion, uh, just, just a, 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 a simple comment, I guess also in, the, in, terms, in physical terms. If you imagine that you have a magnetized medium, the question is, what is the time scale for the particle that enters, in, like in the picture that uh, mm -hmm. Enrique is showing, the time scale for the particle to, um, to feel the, the, the effect of the magnetic field in the medium. So it's like uh, the, the, the inverse of, of, the, of the imaginary, the, the inverse of the imaginary part is that, uh, uh, the, 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 it, well, the imaginary part is the rate. So the inverse is the time that, 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 will, that the fermion will um, thermalize, so to speak, so magnetize, so to speak. So I think that in that sense, you can enter with a plane wave because of that analogy. You, 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 you're just asking yourself how long it'll take the particle uh, to feel the magnetic field effects. And my point is that this is true, what you're saying, but it depends on the magnetic field. For very strong magnetic fields, you cannot do this approximation. So I think the approximation is good for small magnetic fields. And I think your results are correct at low magnetic fields. But when the curvature due to the magnetic field is very strong, you cannot treat it as plane wave anymore. It, other way to say this, as I was said, in a way, if you calculate Landau level, per Landau level, you get a mass for which is different from every or any that, that level, and the width will be different. So when you resum to go back to the plane wave, you have to take it into account. I mean, yeah. Yes, I, I agree, but that's why you get this spectral width, right? Because in the spectral width, you're containing the contribution, let's say in the Fourier series that represents the discrete Landau level, you're getting the contribution for, for the whole uh, set of these discrete states. And that would be my, my reverse, you know, interpretation, but we can discuss it later. It's really technical. Sure. Uh, your result should contain alpha squared. Overall, you just wrote logs, logs, logs. But I think the root alpha squared is probably that whole, right? Yes. OK, just to make sure. Yeah, sure. More comments or questions? Let's thank Enrique okay. again. Thanks a lot. Yeah? Hello? You hear me? Okay. Okay. 